Today we're going to talk about RMS current and how we can use that to determine the health of a, of a system. And we can also use the RMS current to determine if something bad is going to happen before it happens. So before we start getting current limits and following errors and shutting down, uh, we have time to take a, a countermeasure action. Um, you, presumably we have plenty of time uh, before the motor gets too hot. So today we have a collection of motors here. Uh, this is a size 16. Um, all these motors are 5 amp motors. Now whether that's 5 amps RMS or 5 amps peak, we'll have to check with the manufacturer's specification. But this is a size 23 motor that's 5 amps, and they just say A for amps. So I'm not sure if that's uh, peak or RMS. And this is another one that's 5 amps, but this is RMS. And here's another one that's 5 amps, but you know it's a very low voltage winding, so the current has to be higher. Um, this, this guy probably gets pretty hot at 5 amps, but it must have a low inductance and resistance in order not to overheat and shut down. So we're going to take a look at the R, what is RMS. So the RMS is kind of an average of the current, but you know when you're talking about a motor and you're going plus or minus current, the average would be zero. Uh, so we need a method for determining uh, an average over time. And the, the root mean square is actually the effective heating of the motor winding resistance. So this is a good thing for us to understand. Um, and with a, with a brushless motor, you have a sine wave. Uh, you'll have a magnitude of the current vector, and then you'll have the RMS of the sine wave. And that's a square root of two. Um, so in other words, if you had a sine wave to your motor as we're delivering current, whether it's positive current or negative current, we're, we're rotating a current vector uh, to the motor for brushless commutation. So the magnitude of that current vector would be the amps peak, and then the RMS value of that would be 0.707, or uh, you know one over the square root of two, uh, just like it showed in the table here uh, for a sine wave. And there's other waveforms that have an RMS value, but this is the fundamental RMS of the, of the motor. So we're going to look at my little size 16 motor here. And again, it says amps peak sine wave. So that's not exactly the RMS value. That's the peak of the sine wave. And that's the stall current. Um, they also talk about the, the rated current uh, trap and sine. This will be a sinusoidal commutation. Um, so there's a square root of two factor in here too. But an interesting note, note four, values measured peak of the sine wave, right? This talks about the motor 25 degrees C ambient, 125 degrees C winding temperature, motor connected to a 10 inch by 10 inch by quarter inch aluminum mounting plate at 40 degrees C ambient, derated phase current and torque by 12%. So, um, you know, if, if you don't have any way to get the heat out of the motor and your ambient's high, you, you still have to be careful. Um, uh, this is the peak of the sinusoid current in any phase sinusoidally commutated. So the 5.2 amps is, is, uh, is, is a little optimistic. Uh, I would go with the rated current in amps. So 4.2 amps peak of the sine. And that's the value you would normally put in, into the copley. Not the RMS value but the peak of the sign. So when we say amps, we're talking peak of the sign, not the RMS. And if a motor manufacturer said five amps RMS, you multiply that by the square root of two or 1.414 and enter that value into the copley. And so I'll show you where we do that here. Um, normally we, we put in the, the motor data of the you know Newton meters and Newton meters per amp peak or RMS, depending on how they specify it. But a lot of times people don't bother to put the units in there, so we don't always know. And our calculated value uh, is what we would get based on the data we put in. Now, just for testing purposes, I've set the continuous current to one amp peak and three amps peak. And by that, I mean peak of the sign, not RMS. If I put 0.707 in here, that would be amps RMS. If I put in one amp, that's 
peak of the magnitude or the magnitude of the vector that we're rotating to the brushless motor. And then a typical peak current would be three times the continuous. Uh, the bigger the motor, maybe the more, I mean, the Maxon motors have a ridiculous number, uh, but then you got to cut the time down. So, so maybe you could do 10 times the rated current, but for like 100 milliseconds. Um, and with a very large motor, you know, maybe you could do two or three times that for, for five seconds. It all has to do with the heating effect of the coil. Um, anyways, we're going to do some scope tracing here, and we're going to first look at uh, making some moves back and forth. So I'm just doing some simple back and forth moves, and we're going to break this trace down here so we can understand a little bit about what it's doing. Um, so for this, this profile, I'm making a point-to-point -point move, and then I'm coming back. I'm accelerating, running at a velocity, decelerating and stopping. That's in the profile velocity magenta. And you can see you get a little bit of a following error when you excel and decel, uh, plus or minus, you know, less than 100 counts. Um, but the interesting thing is the current, right? My current is spiking up to like 3 amps to accelerate this inertia. I've put a rather uh, much larger inertia on the motor here with a damper. And then when I decelerate, there's also a little peak current. On average, while I'm running uh, at a constant velocity, my currents are low. And I've also traced this I squared T limit here. And this is an accumulator in the drive, which accumulates I squared. Um, when your percentage goes up to 100%, you're going to get a following error fault, and you'll be constantly current limited. Um, right now, my percentage goes up a bit, then comes back down. That's the dark blue trace. And you can see I've also traced the current limiting. While I'm accelerating with peak current, I'm hitting the peak current limit. I'm not getting too much unusual following error for that, so it's probably going to be okay. But normally, you would run your acceleration so that you're not hitting the peak current limit. Now, if we take a look at this over time, um, we have a duty cycle, and with the actual current value, we can see that the RMS current, you know, while we're moving, I grab this and drag it over here. So while I'm moving, my currents are high. So on average, I got 1.65 amps RMS of the data during that move. And as long as I'm dwelling for a long enough period of time, you can see where the one amp point is here. The accumulator has gone back down. But if I had like a 50% duty cycle, you know, my, my current would be on average RMS on the RMS of that. You see the, the average current is zero. But the RMS of that is less over that period of time. So um, we could do this all day. Uh, if I increase the, the frequency, of the moves back and forth, uh, we'll start to see that the I squared T accumulator is getting larger. But you notice it does come back down to zero. So, um, you know, I'm getting kind of near the danger point. So for this, this period here, it looks good. Um, so this is a period of, of cycling. Uh, so we could probably do this all day. As a matter of fact, we can do this all day because the I squared T accumulator is not accumulating and we will not get a current, a current limit fault. Um, so we'll just take a quick peek at the parameter in the drive that's related to the RMS current, 0x131. The current period is set in RMS uh, in units of 10 milliamps or 0.01 amps. And you can read this over and over again as long as you read it every, less than every four seconds, you'll get a pretty accurate reading. Um, you can also set the period at which you want to read it. Let's say you're doing this over CAN at a regular basis. Uh, you could do it at a much, much shorter interval. Um, but the, the repetition of the reading is what gives you the, the RMS. So we can see with this higher duty cycle, uh, we're, we're approaching the one amp. Uh, as I read this periodically, less than once every four seconds, um, I have an RMS current that says I can do this all day. Um, 
if I increase this frequency, uh, you'll notice that the RMS current will start to grow. And this is the danger zone. When you're above the one amp, uh, you're gonna start accumulating your I squared T limit. And then eventually you're gonna get a following error and something bad's gonna happen. Um, so you can see this I squared T limit starting to grow here. I'm only at 20%. I got plenty of time before I have a problem, but I should take corrective action and I should reduce my cycling uh, because I'm I'm hitting the, this is the danger zone here. Danger's coming, Will Robinson, look out. Um, so I'm just gonna let that run for a moment. And uh, we'll take a look at a paper on the I squared, I squared T limiting. While I'm struggling, I'm letting it run. Uh, we're starting to get following errors and current limits all over the place because my RMS current was above an amp. Um, I'm gonna take a look at the, the paper on the I squared T limiting. And so this I squared T, you know, the, the watts to, uh, to the motor will produce heating. Okay, so if we know the, the square of the current over a period of time, we multiply that by the winding resistance, we're gonna get the effective heating of the motor. So this is a predictive modeling for determining the temperature of the motor, okay? And so this I squared T limit is designed to protect the motor from overheating. Now, of course, we can hook up a thermal switch to be the ultimate shutdown if the coil gets too hot, but we can also protect the motor by setting the I squared T limits here. And so this paper talks about how the I squared T is used to determine the heat of the motor. Um, sort of the, 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 the key points I wanna get out of this is uh, every motor will have a continuous and a peak current. When we square it and multiply it by its time, we'll get an amper squared, which we can then use the amper squared in this formula to determine the time that we can run at a, at a certain current that's not peak. Let's say I'm running at you know 12 amps. But how long can I run at 12 amps? Well, it depends on the peak and continuous rating of the motor and the time at that, You know, a second for the bigger motors and hundreds of milliseconds for the tiny motors. Uh, and a really large motor might be a couple of seconds. Um, um, anyways, you can calculate the time at this lower current uh, actually, this this one's showing the, the time if I was at 23 amps, right? So I'm going way over the current peak uh, to something larger, and it shows me that the time is much shorter. So I used half a second here, and I get, you know, half of that again here if I try to go above. And that's the effective heating of the motor. And so that's what the I squared T limiting is doing in the drive. It's just protecting the motor from overheating. What it's, what it's not doing is preventing us from having problems with, you know, if you're, if you're at a continuous current limit constantly, your following error, your motion profile suffers, and, uh, you know, eventually you're, you're gonna get a following error uh, under normal conditions. Um, and again, we're current limiting constantly, and our RMS current is at an amp. And so that's the danger zone right there. So we can we can use this this function or this feature in the drive uh, to preempt something bad happening. So this is a 